Alright, today I'm counting down the top 10 most disgusting dishes MasterChef has ever seen. And believe me, I've got just the pick to get this list started. But this contestant made so many bad choices, all of which ended up with him in hot water. But this one right here was hands down the worst dish of the entire season. So in one of the episodes from season 5, the MasterChef crew got down to the nitty gritty of making a killer meatloaf dish. And this is how they came up with the idea. Courtney chose a stunning meatloaf. Well, Courtney, the superstar who aced the mystery box challenge, picked meatloaf as the night's target. And guess what? Her powers weren't limited to just choosing meatloaf. There are 20 fierce competitors out there. Only half of them will have to cook tonight. Yep, the power to save some contestants, but sadly, Whitney didn't make the cut. Anyway, they kicked off the meatloaf challenge, and Ramsay started dishing out his expert advice. So I would do something modern. I would line my mold with the bacon. Mm -hmm. Well, he was all about adding a modern twist and suggested lining the dish with bacon. And Graham also chimed in, talking about a light coating of breadcrumbs and throwing in some mushrooms for good measure. But one thing all the judges were on the same page about was this. If they don't taste the seasoning mm -hmm. of the pate before they start cooking right. it. Skipping the tasting for seasoning step would be a major blunder. Now, what was Ramsey's strategy, you ask? Make your blends. Mm -hmm. Get your seasoning in there and then fry off a small amount before you bake it. Yep, to fry it off a bit, taste it, and then dial in the tweaks. Sounds like the bare minimum for getting a decent meatloaf, but apparently that was advice these contestants needed. Now, talking about Whitney, and winning MasterChef was like her golden ticket to complete what she started. So let's see what her big plan for snagging the win was. I'm just making kind of a little Asian style meatloaf with a mango glaze. She came up with an Asian style meatloaf with a sweet mango glaze. However, when she presented her dish, Dan wasn't holding back. Pedestrian. Well, we'll see. Because when Ramsey took a bite, oh boy, it was not looking good. I can't think of anything worse to go in a meatloaf. Lemongrass and mango. The glaze was stealing the show way more than it ought to, and Ramsey started throwing out words like bland and meatloaf desert to describe what she had brought to the table. But he wasn't done. But unfortunately, you've taken a TV dinner and turned it into a TV disaster. Hey, what did the meatloaf ever do to you? Okay, now it was time for the results. Ramsey announced that there were three worst dishes, and at least one of them would be hitting the road. Stephanie was called out first, and then Graham brought Dan into the firing line. And guess who Joe called out? Now the trio stood there, probably feeling far more heat than all of their meatloaves put together. Before Ramsey announced who'd be sent packing, he had another bomb to drop. None of them did justice to the humble meatloaf. At first, First, Dan stepped forward, and Ramsey laid it out. He had gone completely off the rails, and had ideas that far outstripped his talent. But there were still two more worse dishes to get through. But soon enough, it was Courtney's turn to reveal who was heading home. She talked about the importance of passion and love in cooking, and pointed out the lack thereof they'd shown in this challenge was ultimately going to send somebody home. And guess whose name she called out? I believe you're going to send home. Whitney. Well, she was spot on. Ramsey confirmed as much. Stephanie was relieved and teary-eyed as she headed back to her station. Well, Whitney, with a heavy heart, took off her apron and walked away. The most upset that I had to leave this early due to something so simple as a meatloaf. She was bummed that something as conceptually simple as a meatloaf cost her her dream. But she wasn't about to give up. She was going back home to get started all over again. But do you think Whitney should have been given another chance? Head on over to my channel's Discord server to let me know. And while you do that, don't forget to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications for good measure. After all, you wouldn't want to miss my future uploads, right? I know I wouldn't. Anyway, that aside, do you remember what happened when MasterChef doubled the fun with a two-hour double feature for the Mexican Tag Team Challenge? All of these home cooks right here are going to be competing in teams of two. So, this is what they were up against. Perfect platter of...
Mexican food. A perfect platter of Mexican staples was a hell of a tall task. And if you're wondering what that was gonna look like, well, Chef Aron set the bar high. Starting here, we have some homemade tortilla chips with the wonderful pico de gallo. Yeah, given that he was putting his culture on the line for the contestants to potentially screw up, it's no wonder why he'd want to go all out. And then he dropped the bomb. The contestants had to replicate the entire platter flawlessly. But here's the catch. They were gonna be in teams, but they wouldn't be cooking together. One of you starts cooking, and your partner must stand at the end of your station. You want to come out the gate strong, but you want to finish even stronger. The deal would be that one of them would take the lead while the other stood at the end of the counter. They could talk, but not help. However, Yashika and Ebony were paired together, and they had some serious concerns about it. Yashika and I both have extra aggressive sister behavior. They liked each other well enough, sure, but both were strong, vocal women, and putting them together was undoubtedly gonna cause them to butt heads. And as they dove into the challenge, it became abundantly clear that the prophecy had come to pass. We need to do your Neither was listening to each other about anything, and the platter they ended up with ended up suffering for it. They don't got the sugar coat. I know, but we gotta get the taquitos rolled up. Taquitos gotta roll. Ebony and Yashika were nowhere near being on the same page. Well, everyone else managed to skate by to varying degrees of success. Keyword being success. But how do you think the judges reacted? Well, it definitely wasn't gonna be pretty, I'll tell you that much. Ebony and Yashika, they are nowhere near on the same page. I don't know if they're gonna make it. But instead of worrying about their platter, this is what the dream team of Ebony and Yashika was up to. I think multitasking was a big issue. I had to do half the try by myself. Right off the bat, they started to argue about whose fault it was that the platter didn't come together. And Ebony made some bold claims that she had to handle everything herself. But Ramsey wasn't interested in any excuses at this point of the competition. So he had just one thing to say. I mean, it's honest, tell the truth. What's on the truth? I think we did it together. Yeah, he didn't come this far just to start letting contestants down gently. The argument unfolded right in front of Ramsey, with Ebony dropping the bomb that Yashika was the new Jeff. And remember how I said Ramsey probably felt like he was babysitting at the top of the video? Well, I wasn't kidding. There's no synergy, no harmony, but more importantly, you ignored each other. No way Ramsey was gonna hold back. He said how he had never seen two people more distant from each other. He also pointed out that they're in ability to put their egos aside and get the job done was going to be at least one of their undoings. It was an embarrassing moment for both chefs. How are they going to work in a restaurant if they couldn't stand each other in the competition? But get this, all of that was before he even started looking even slightly deeper at the platter. Is it a magic trick? Shake the bag upside down, the shore's gonna be a white rabbit. What is that? I've seen more appetizing diapers. Yeah, that taco looking like a diaper was a pretty apt observation. But the funniest part was when Ramsey said this. Would you just do me a little favor? Say a prayer before I tuck into the he requested Yashika say a prayer for him before tasting the food. But I don't think that helped him much. Thank you for my six bag. Uh, disgusting. Yeah, not even God was gonna be able to save that mess. But despite literally everything I've gone over up to this point, both Ebony and Yashika managed to survive and cook another day. In fact, Ebony even went on to make it to the finals. I definitely didn't have that upset on my bingo card when I was watching the season as it came out back in 2017. Thankfully, she didn't snipe the win for my boy Dino. Silver linings, I guess. But here comes another contestant who wasn't exactly prepared for what the competition demanded. During one of the challenges in season three, Helene Leeds presented a risotto dish, and it was so bad that calling it a failure would be generous. Helene had crafted little baskets from burdock root to hold her scallops, but those dainty little baskets weren't gonna save Helene from the undercooked risotto and raw scallop she had put into them. Taking the critique a step further, Joe didn't hold back. He grabbed some 
of Helene's food and, say it with me now, tossed it into the trash. Shocker. In all seriousness though, Helene was showing her serious lack of chops from day one. And this was far from the only time she served such a ridiculous dish. For example, during the fresh versus canned elimination test, this is what Helene was asked to cook. She's definitely not a threat. However, she interpreted the gift from Ryan as a strategic move, thinking he considered her a weaker contestant and wanted to give her a challenge. But you have to give it to her. Despite the pressure, she handled the crab with confidence. I know how to cook a crab, I know how to pick a crab, and I know how to season a crab. She even guided fellow contestant Tanya on handling her own live crab. During the cook, Ramsey paid Helene a visit and immediately noticed how much of a mess she'd made. Look at the ingredients from there, I all know. the way to here. I like options what in the hell are you doing? Undoubtedly, with one of his eyes twitching, he found the strength to ask her about her dish. And this is when Helene stated that she was making a tomato-based crab soup and assured Ramsey she was preparing just one portion. But Ramsey reminded her of something important. I haven't seen you win anything yet. I've been struggling. You've been struggling. I've been Why? struggling because I don't work well under pressure. Helene admitted that she was struggling in the competition, particularly with the concept of working under pressure. This revelation surprised Ramsey, who then asked if she had any idea what was coming next. As Ramsey left, Helene acknowledged that the competition was only going to get tougher. She'd have to find some way to shape up, or she'd have to ship out. Not surprisingly, when Helene faced the judges, Joe expressed some concerns. Helene, also, same thing. I think that she has no idea what she's doing. And it wasn't just Joe. Graham also had a few things to say. And she's from the eastern shore of Maryland. That's like Crabville, you know? She should be able to do this blindfolded. Damn right. Anyone from Maryland should at the very least do decently in a crab challenge, let alone dominate it. But of course, that's not how things turned out for Helene. When it came time to present her crab soup with cornbread, Helene acknowledged that her soup ended up thicker than intended, but insisted it retain the flavors and styles she aimed for. Now, Joe was the first to taste her dish. You've done a great job of uh, taking a pungenous crab and making it taste like canned crab. Well, he surprisingly, or maybe sarcastically, praised her for making fresh crab taste like canned crab. Yeah, definitely sarcastically now that I think about it. However, Graham had a different take. It's almost more like a jambalaya or something. You know, when you put that on fork, it looks like shredded wheat. He compared it to a jambalaya and pointed out that the shredded crab may as well have been indistinguishable from cereal on his fork. But he somehow managed to take it up a notch. Waste of a great product. Safe to say, not Helene's finest moment. I'm not entirely sure she ever had one, but you get my point. But that wasn't even the worst part. Ramsey dipped the cornbread into the soup and quickly discovered an issue. Is that salt on top of the uh, cornbread? When he asked whether or not Helene had bothered to season the cornbread, well, she admitted she'd added a pinch, but Ramsey wasn't buying it. If you asked me to pay $25 for that, uh, I wouldn't pay you 25 cents for that one. Always the seasoning. Now Helene was super shocked along with embarrassed as all get out. And I can't say I blame her. It shouldn't come as a surprise that Helene ended up being in the bottom four and after Frank and Mike returned to their stations, Ramsey advised her to deliver if she wanted to pursue a light, healthy style of cooking. But despite her commitments, Helene was ultimately eliminated for, well, pretty much everything I've mentioned so far. Your time in MasterChef is done, thank you. Please put your apron on your station. But before leaving, Ramsey offered her words of encouragement, telling her to keep her head high while keeping up with her education. But she wasn't the only one whose confidence has taken a hit over the years. In the Duck Mystery Box Challenge, Ryan kept a low profile during the actual cook. However, when the time for judgment rolled around, he was the first person called up. Nowhere to hide for him. The first person would like to invite down Ryan, let's go. Ryan at least looked confident and told himself that he wasn't surprised to be in the top group. A not so subtle hint that the other home cooks needed to up their game. However, the tables turned when Ryan, along with the other two cooks in the supposed top three, Samantha and Scott, for those of you keeping score from home, learned that they were actually called down for having the worst three dishes. And let me tell ya, you could pinpoint the exact moment when his heart broke. I mean, check it out. What we think are the worst three dishes. 
That smug grin of his quickly faded, as they were informed that one of them was going to be headed out the door sooner or later. To make things worse, remember, Ryan was the first up. He presented a balsamic rum glazed duck breast with caramelized bananas and sweet potato puree. But when Joe got his hands on it, he did what Joe does best. You proud of this? It's rendered to the point of being dry. Joe questioned if Ryan was proud of his creation, pointing out that the duck was overcooked. Apparently, getting that crispy skin had a pretty nasty side effect. He also criticized the decision to add bananas to the plate, emphasizing that Ryan had referred to them earlier as the devil in the box. Meanwhile, Graham came up with a rather funny review. It looks like you plated it and then stepped on it. Well, that was definitely one way to describe it. But he wasn't done. He then went on to say that the bananas were cooked better than the duck itself. And this is when Ramsey pitched in with some humor of his own. You've gone bananas. That's what's happened. You've gone bananas. Anyway, despite the criticism, Ramsey acknowledged that Ryan was able to cook the duck relatively well. But everything around it was beyond dreadful. I made a balsamic rum glazed duck breast with some caramelized bananas. In the end, Scott was the first to be saved amongst the three, leaving the elimination battle between our main man Ryan and Samantha. Before Ramsey could announce his decision, Ryan took the opportunity to plead his case, expressing anything and everything he could think of that had the slightest chance to keep him from going home. And I'm not, definitely not ready to go home yet. But he didn't stop there. He continued to argue that compared to Samantha, his duck was better executed. Ramsey interrupted his plea, stating that he had no room to beg. He was there to compete, not judge. Eventually, Samantha was asked to leave, and Ryan was sent back to his station. Maybe there was something to that begging after all, huh? But these next two had a lot of begging and bargaining to get to. Make way for the notorious duo, Dan and Cutter from season five. The two got a solid 60 minutes to whip up a killer dish, but things took a turn from the moment they hit the pantry. I think basically put two variations of the similar Sauce, but not the same sauce. We're still making two Cutter figured using two different lean proteins wouldn't blend well, but Dan wasn't having any of it. Eventually, the miscommunication led to confusion, and that confusion completely ruined the most important part of the creation process. That's it. Let's go. We're gonna have to go with this. We have two proteins that do not pair together. Yeah, maybe less arguing, more, well, picking ingredients next time, huh, boys? The drama continued as the judges swung by to check out the team's progress. While Cutter explains that they were going for venison and tuna, Dan was already working on the tuna. Seeing this, Cutter used Ramsey as a sounding board for a hell of a venting sash. Dan goes off on a wild tangent in the pantry, and by the time we got out of there, we ran out of time. I think that calling your own partner an idiot to their face may not have been the most strategic move here, dude. Anyway, when it was time to present their masterpiece, Courtney took one look at it, and then another, and then a third. And still, she could barely see any food on the plate. On the other hand, Ramsey was plain old disgusted. What in the f*** is that? Oh yeah, believe me, he was embarrassed for them. But guess what Cutter decided to do? He threw Dan under the bus for the umpteenth time. He has an idea, I listened to him. Yeah, I told him I didn't like it. He just starts grabbing However, Dan wasn't about to take the fall for his partner in crime. We went in there, I gave my idea, he gave his idea, we grabbed the proteins. And it didn't take long for Ramsey to get sick of their little blame game. What if you pick up a basket, fill it up? and then bring it back. At least you got something tangible to work with. Either way, he made the poor decision to give it a taste. It's possibly one of the worst dishes in this competition so far. Now, that's a label I wouldn't even want to be associated with. Anyway, Joe was the next one in line to taste the dish, but Cutter was quick to remind him of something. You don't have to eat it, really. You don't. I'm a judge here, so why don't you let me figure out what I have to do? Of course Joe shut him down, telling him to shut up and let him do his thing. And what did he do exactly? Well, let's just say it wouldn't take a genius to figure out. Do the honors. 
poor Graham didn't even get a shot at tasting the disaster. Or maybe Lucky Graham? I don't know. I don't think he had anything to complain about at the end of the day. Meanwhile, Dan and Cutter were still at each other's throats. They were sure they were going to be landing in the pressure test and blamed each other for their untimely fate. But did they actually make it to the pressure test? You four home cooks will now be cooking against each other in a pressure test. I mean, yeah, no points for guessing. And everyone's favorite dynamic duo ended up duking it out with Christian and Francis B. In the end, although Cutter and Francis B ended up in the bottom two, Cutter managed to scrape by and was saved from elimination. For now. Well, that's it for today. Do any other ridiculous dishes from MasterChef come to mind that I missed? Let me know in the comments down below. I've talked the older season stinkers to death. So, why don't we stay in the realm of new school stuff this time around and see where it takes us? With that in mind, in Season 13, Episode 5, things took a turn for the worse for one particular contestant during the Mystery Box Challenge. The home cooks were asked to cook something inspired by a special event, the state fair. But there was more to the challenge than just the fun and festivity. The fun really begins now. Each contestant had to showcase a dish that embodied the essence of their home state's fair cuisine, something that truly represented their state. However, there was a catch. This is not an excuse to just deep fry something and call it a day, right? Oh, come on. The whole point of the state fair is the deep fried food, right? <sighs> but hey, the judges wanted to test the contestants' skills. They weren't here to take it easy today. And believe me, they were very specific about what they expected from the challenge. Cook an elevated version of classic state fair food. Yep. Sticking to the source wasn't going to be good enough. An elevated version of the dish that's fitting for a master chef was going to be their ticket up. And just when you thought the challenge couldn't get any tougher, Ramsey decided to drop another massive bomb. You'll cook alongside everyone else from your home region. Oh yeah, they were in a tough one for sure. What's more, the winner of the challenge would have the power to save their whole region from elimination. As was a theme at that point of the season. As for the worst performing contestant, they would be shown the door. Yeah, this season of MasterChef wasn't really into the whole challenge then elimination format. Every challenge could spell doom for anyone. Speaking of doom, let me draw your attention to Wayne from the Midwest for a second here. Once the challenge kicked off, all the home cooks dashed towards the pantry to pick out their arsenal of ingredients. Let's go, guys. Yeah. And it's at this point that Wayne made his first mistake. A mistake that stemmed from the very concept of his dish. I am making an incredible pumpkin risotto where I'm from in Ohio. Wayne wanted to bring the flavors of the Circleville Pumpkin Festival, which draws its roots as far back as 1903, to the MasterChef kitchen. I mean, that was definitely the right call for this challenge. However, his idea of how he wanted to elevate is what screwed things up for him. I'm gonna top it with the butter poached lobster to elevate it. You see, the challenge was to improve on the baseline of the dish, not to overwhelm it to the extent of losing its originality. But Wayne was determined to make the plan he cooked up work. I plan to win it for my team today. I mean, what could go wrong with a risotto, right? Well, turns out, pretty much everything. When the judges walked up to him during halftime, Joe was already poking holes in Wayne's confidence, as he is wont to do. Risotto. risotto. Have you ever watched MasterChef before? Maybe once or twice. Well, I guess that was the clue Wayne needed to fix his dish, because risotto might look simple. But if you've ever watched a second of Hell's Kitchen, you know just how wrong it could go. It's one of the most difficult dishes because it's so hard to make and we're yeah. very critical. Calling the judges skeptical would be an understatement. Risotto is high risk dish. But he'd already made his choice. I'm a competitive baseball player mm -hmm. and I believe if you're going to step into the box, you try to make hard contact. You're swinging for the fences. Yeah, I'm going to win this challenge. However, towards the end of prep, Wayne ran into some trouble, because of course he did. I'm a little concerned that the risotto is still a little bit crunchy. And you don't have to be a culinary expert to know that Wayne was headed straight for elimination. But he just couldn't see it. I've always taken risks, and I thrive in high-pressure situations. Yeah, we'll see about that. 
because when it was time for the judges to taste the dish, their reaction finally brought Wayne back down to earth. You tasted that? Yes. Tastes right to you? I, it, it could be better. Joe never looks happy, but you could for sure tell the dish didn't put him in a good mood. Don't even get me started on Aron's reaction. His face twisted in pure disgust, and you'd be blind not to see that. Regardless, turns out, it was Wayne's lucky day. Remember when I told you that the best dish would win immunity for the whole team? Well, fortunately for Wayne, Kyle was over here carrying the entire Midwest region on his back and managed to drag him to safety at the last second. You and the whole of the Midwest are safe from elimination. Awesome. Am I still salty about this? <laughs> what gave you that indication? <sighs> anyway, that doesn't mean the judges let Wayne off the hook that easily. Wayne, uh, FYI, that risotto was not on point tonight. It was wrong on every aspect. As if that wasn't enough of an embarrassment, Joe had more to say. You certainly would have been in the bottom, so you can thank your teammate Kyle for your spot on the balcony. Okay. Talk about a narrow miss. But this next contestant, from the West this time, wasn't as lucky as Wayne. Yep, I'm talking about Amanda, who, in the very same challenge that almost got Wayne kicked off the show, decided to make something rather simple. I am making fish tacos. Now, Amanda claimed to be a health freak, and it showed in her food. But since she had to stand out from the rest, she decided to risk it a little. Good my question. approach is I'm going to do it two ways, kind of like my interpretation of that red and green sauce. To make things even more challenging, she also decided to make her own tortillas. I just got my apron. I do not want to give it back. It was definitely a gamble. And Arone saw it for what it was. One slip up and her entire dish could go downhill pretty fast. But if she pulled it off, she'd be riding pretty high. And unlike Wayne, Amanda knew exactly what she was getting into. Are you out of your wheelhouse a little bit, Amanda, with this? Way out of my wheelhouse. Clearly, she wanted to go big or go home. But sadly, I think you know which way the wind turned for our hero here. When Amanda started working on her dish, things didn't go exactly as planned. Ah, shoot. I'm not ready to go back and be a stay-at-home mom. Although Amanda wasn't willing to give up, the judges were thinking that she should have pivoted long ago. When Aron asked her if she was happy with her tacos, Amanda, although a little nervous, tried to put on a brave face. Do you feel that you've elevated the taco? I do. I'm happy with the tortillas. Sadly, those very tacos Amanda was so proud of landed her in the bottom three. I went way out of my comfort zone. I cooked something I've never cooked before. When it was time for the tasting, Amanda's confidence took a nosedive. But she tried her best to upsell her dish. One is a very fresh green sauce and one is a very spicy red sauce. However, the judges weren't impressed. Nothing about her dish looked appealing, and Ramsey was brutally honest with his feedback. I can nip outside and 300 meters down the road, I can buy one at $3 that will look better than those. And he didn't stop at that. He decided to give it to her straight. No holds barred. They just look sad. Amanda knew exactly where this was going. She was fighting to hold her tears back, but the judges had to do their part and dissect every last bit of the dish. Believe me, they weren't able to find a single positive thing about it. Sadly, my tortilla was very thick, very dry. It needs at least some color on there. And that extended to the fish itself, too. Just sticking the fish in the oven and baking it is not the smartest way of cooking fish. Land, no acid, no heat. Everything that could have gone wrong in the taco making process did go wrong. And Ramsey went on and on on about it. Amanda was so disappointed in herself that she decided to interrupt Ramsey mid-sentence. And I don't even have to tell you how he reacted. I should thinking, have just done my- I'll just quickly finish my sentence, please. Ramsey was doing his best to hold back his frustration. He clearly didn't want to blow up on her because Amanda looked like she could break down at any moment. And since this wasn't Hell's Kitchen, it was a roadblock for him, not an opportunity. But he had to lay down the truth at the end of the day. I'm thinking back to the audition and the wow factor. 
I think you've gone down a notch. Now, if anyone deserved to be frustrated with what Amanda was selling, it was her own. It's just a matter of mis-execution. I think tacos can be elevated. Sadly, this is not it. Meanwhile, Joe was apparently in the middle of a huge character arc. If I came to your house, you gave me that, you said you cooked tacos for the first time, I'd say they were good because I'm polite. Joe and politeness, huh? Well, that's a new one. Here's hoping it lasts. Totally not foreshadowing. But anyway, Amanda's attempt at fish tacos failed to hit the mark on multiple levels. And I'm sure you can see where this is going. Say goodbye to your region's teammates and drop your apron on your stove, please. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, those fish tacos were her one-way ticket out of the competition. But speaking of, this next challenge turned out to be the bane of two contestants' existence at the same time. Yeah, I'm keeping the season 13 train going. Because episode 16 introduced the contestants to a pretty complex challenge. Not the wall, like, come on, anything but the wall. And believe me, Colby was dreading it before it even kicked off. This is a chaotic challenge. Now, if you're new to the show, let me introduce you to a huge staple challenge. One whose very name puts fear into the hearts of even the bravest contestants. It's eight feet tall, 55 feet long, and it's the biggest obstacle in this whole competition. The wall. The contestants would have to cook in pairs on opposite sides of the wall. But here's what makes it one of the toughest challenges on the show. You must create dishes that taste and look identical. Communication was the only tool they had access to in order to whip up dishes that not only tasted identical, but also looked identical too. Every last detail demanded nothing short of perfection. But that's not the only twist the judges threw their way. Both cooks from the worst performing team will be going home. Double elimination. You could have the best night imaginable in the kitchen, but if your partner didn't show up, it was game over for the both of you. So Colby and Bryn found themselves paired for the challenge, and this is what they decided to make. We are making a crispy skinned salmon with a parsnip puree. Well, even in spite of the huge wall looming over them, Colby and Bryn went all in on a massive risk. Braised fennel and a deep red wine, raspberry, and pear sauce. Now, Ramsey had never seen a raspberry sauce paired with salmon before. So he definitely had his eyes on the pair to see if they could pull it off. Anyway, Colby and Bryn got off to a great start. But halfway through the challenge, they ran into communication issues. Oh, did you put it in already? Yeah. Oh, you didn't tell me. All right, give me a second. And considering communication was their only lifeline, they were walking down the road to ruin. And the judges noticed it right away. Wow, look at Colby and Bryn. They failed to start cooking their salmon together. Forget about the communication breakdown. Joe wasn't even too sure about the dish on a conceptual level. We got this pear and raspberry red wine reduction. Never even heard of it. Forget about duplicating it. Yeah, something tells me they weren't going to pull this one off. The dish needed to be delicious and perfectly identical to its pear. And making something for the first time, let alone inventing something new, was beyond short-sighted. Do we like this sauce? Well, I think there's going to be a lot of good brightness from this raspberry and pear. But it was Colby and Bryn's communication falling apart that really sent things spiraling. When it was time to plate up, Colby got real nervous. I don't think I did it right. It's okay. Don't worry. Mine looks like messy too. Not exactly the kind of assurance either of them needed, that's for sure. But the pressure wasn't on Colby and Bryn alone. Thanks to, I don't know, the huge wall that stood between them. But when Colby and Bryn walked up to the judges' table for the tasting, they couldn't have been prepared for what was to come. These dishes look very different. The pair had already lost points for their presentation. But nonetheless, Ramsey was quick to notice Bryn's salmon. Bryn, uh, first off, uh, salmon beautifully seared on top of that skin, nice and crispy. Yeah, he was pretty impressed with the cook, but it wasn't perfect. But the sauce on the outside yeah. just looks bizarre. Ramsey was pretty straightforward with his feedback, but Joe tossed all the episode 5 character growth he went through aside and got as brutal as ever. These sauces, both of them, don't even look like a sauce. They look like pureed baby food. Yeah, that's gotta hurt. Meanwhile, Colby's plate had even more flaws for them to rip apart. That salmon does not look cooked. 
Speaking of, when Joe cut through Colby's salmon. This is way under. I mean, this never saw even heat in the center. Yup. What a mess. Kobe, I'm somebody that loves salmon a little under, but this is egregious. Meanwhile, Bryn's salmon was cooked to perfection, if that wasn't already clear. Glistening, moist, pink, just how we want salmon to be. But there was nothing to smile about. Not only because the two's fates were tethered, but because the sauce was also a massive flop, exactly as expected. The sauce doesn't make sense. Coming back to Colby's dish, Ramsay couldn't have said it more bluntly. Salmon hasn't even had the temperature inside. No seasoning in the puree, and the sauce again. It does not make sense. And to make things worse, Joe added more insult to injury. Everything that you see is wrong with the dish is actually wrong on your palate as well. They were just so far off base. And Bryn was having a hard time trying to figure out how Colby's salmon turned out to be raw when she dropped her filet 30 seconds after him. Maybe the guy forgot to turn his burner on. Eh, another mystery for me to mull over when I'm trying to fall asleep. That aside, there was no doubt it was a tough challenge, but the outcome was gonna be even tougher for the two of them. When it was time to reveal the worst performing pair, Colby and Bryn knew exactly what to expect. Jennifer, please say goodbye and make your way up to the balcony. Despite the disappointing performance, Ramsey had a few words of encouragement to share with Bryn, at least. Tenacious, feisty chef that wows every time. That's how I'm gonna remember you. As for Colby, he might have failed to meet expectations that night, but that doesn't mean Ramsey wasn't impressed with his journey overall. You cook with your heart and that flavor profile is unique. And with the two of them leaving a whole lot of tears in their wake as they went, I think it's a good idea to step just one season back in time. Let's move on to this next contestant, who did his best to make a comeback, but it didn't exactly pan out for him. MasterChef is all about redemption, and in season 12, all-star competitors from the previous 11 seasons returned to see if they had learned from their mistakes, and episode 9 put their skills to the test. Choose one of these incredible desserts and replicate it perfectly. So the deal was dessert replication. So they were gonna have to be a lot more precise than normal to pull off their vision. And right from the start, one contestant in particular started to feel the pressure. I'm afraid of those difficult ones like the Paris breast or those layer cakes. Tommy was doing his best to make his mark, but his confidence had taken a major hit. Because they take so many different techniques to roll into one confection. Yeah, no joke. And just like any other challenge, the cooks who came the closest to replicating the dessert would have a chance of winning the immunity pin. And the ones who failed, well, I'm sure you can guess. Now, Christian, the winner of the previous challenge, had the power to pick the order of the contestants. The ones that went first would have a wider range of desserts to choose from. And honestly, Tommy was lucky to go third, but completely squandered that luck. The lemon meringue tart. Pick people that I'm less threatened by. Yeah, a pretty easy dish overall. And the dude was beaming with confidence because of it. A nice change from before, but when it was time to get baking, it was gone again. This is not a calm kitchen. Halfway through, when Ramsey walked up to a station for a quick chat, Tommy did his best to look confident. I know what it's supposed to look like. You got a beautiful pet sucre and sugar paste at the bottom. Not an ounce of nervousness. For a second, I thought Tommy knew exactly what he was doing. But considering I'm talking about him in this video of all videos, I'm sure you can figure out where this was headed. Everybody else has got their tarts in, but Tommy's dough is still in the fridge. But instead of buckling down and getting moving, he completely missed his window of opportunity to get it in the oven on time. When Ramsey checked in on him, Tommy was struggling to keep up. Tommy, is that tart in yet? No, it's not in yet. Oh my goodness me. Yeah, while most contestants were dashing towards the oven, Tommy was still working on his meringue. At the pace he was moving, even serving it raw but together was looking less and less likely. But he gave it a shot anyway. However, sometime later, he realized he'd made a grave mistake. I made the mistake of putting my tart dough into the blast chiller instead of the refrigerator. And Ramsey was genuinely more concerned than disappointed at this point. Tommy, yes, chef. the pastry's frozen. I know it's... 
However, Tani was adamant on making things work. It's got more cracks in it than the Nevada desert. I'm gonna get the cracks out. This is an absolute disaster. Regardless, Tommy was no fool. He knew exactly how doomed he was, but Ramsey wasn't willing to give up on him yet. If you reshape that dough, roll it out, and get it in that tar shell, that's what I'd be doing if I was in your shoes, yeah? It was finally time for the judges to taste the desserts, and Tommy was clearly dreading his turn, but he had nowhere to hide. One of the simplest desserts and I messed it up. And after inevitably finding himself in the bottom three, he was doomed. It's got a big crack all the way through here, and it looks underbaked. I mean, we all saw that one coming. And remember that the whole challenge was replicating the dessert? Well, Tommy's dish in the original looked more like distant cousins than twins. Yours are very thick, these are very thin. And Aron took the opportunity to expand on Ramsey's concern. Also, with the garnishes, there's miscues as far as you piping the meringue in. Yours are very thick, these are very thin. But that was just about the presentation. So, what about the taste? Now, this could be a deal breaker for Tommy. But the deal wasn't what broke for him. Tommy, as you can see, it's totally raw. Not just raw. The meringue was completely overwhipped, leaving it beyond watery. Aron seemed to have a good idea of what went wrong. Tommy had the skill, he had the passion, but not the time. But time management is the name of the game. A game that Tommy had 100% lost. It's just really important for you to see what we're tasting. We've got more pastry than we have curd. That's just pure pastry. And then, when it was time for the eliminations, Tommy braced himself for the inevitable. Tommy. Tommy had a crazy amount of potential, but not many viewers were fans of his performance on the show. Most of them believed that Tommy had overstayed his welcome and his elimination was more of a foregone conclusion than anything else. In fact, Ramsey felt there was no reason for him to be on the show, considering he mistook a blast chiller for a refrigerator. Tonight, you forgot the basics. Aron pitched in his own disappointment, that it was a shame that things had to end so badly. Tommy had nothing to say in return. He knew that his time on the show had come to an end. I had an absolute cascade of disaster. However, he managed to put a smile on everyone's face by departing, doing the thing he knew how to do best. I'm going home. If you want to know how to go out with class, look no further than Tommy Walton. I'm never going to stop loving the guy, no matter how badly he crashes and burns. So, can you think of more times when chefs served horrible food on MasterChef? Get in the comments if you got a favorite, or, well, a uh, least favorite, I guess. So, in Season 4, Episode 4, a disaster of insane proportions unfolded after the Mystery Box Challenge was revealed. The contestants would dive straight into the elimination round, and this time, the mission was to master the delicate langoustine in a mere 60 minutes. So Howard, thinking big, decided on a hell of a gamble. He dropped a citrus salad bomb with what he called a champion vinaigrette. Well, let's see how that goes for you, champ. Now, Ramsey slammed Howard's dish, saying he should have ditched half the plate and those three lemon slices. Did you disappear into the library for half an hour? No, I did not. But here comes the real shocker. Howard was proud of his creation. His dish was all about that vinaigrette, but the judges weren't buying it. Ramsey asked if there was any vinaigrette on the plate in the first place, claiming that all he saw was regret. To make things worse, Joe and Aron confirmed that there was zero vinegar in the dish. No, sir, I see no vinegar. Sure. Ramsey wasn't amused. He claimed that the dish was a joke and flat out refused to put it in his mouth. In fact, I'm not even gonna eat it. Well, just like this viewer said, Howard had messed up big time. And honestly, not much more needs to be said than that. Plain and simple. Meanwhile, Joe didn't pull any punches either, as expected. He went all in, telling Howard that he'd vouched for him, hyped up his skills. And now, he was faced with the disappointment of the century. Joe then immediately floated the idea of giving Howard the boot, practically putting him out of his misery. But that never happened. At least, not in this episode. The judges decided to give him another chance or five before they let him go. But not all viewers were happy with this decision. 
most of them called out the show for making biased decisions. MasterChef waits for no one, and certainly not for lackluster vinaigrettes and questionable citrus salads. But what about those handful of other episodes he was in? Well, stay tuned to the channel. I have a feeling I'll be back with more Howard sooner rather than later. As of now, though, I think he needed more time and a lot of practice to perfect his skills. There's a big chance I'm not going to make it through this. And hey, if you agree, don't forget to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. Especially so you don't miss out on checking back in with Howard. Also, my channel's Discord server is the perfect place to discuss all things MasterChef. Now, when it comes to serving up shitty dishes, Howard was far from the only one. Well, make way for the one and only, Sasha. Ramsey took one look at Sasha's dish before dropping one of the most nasty comments he's ever made. First of all, it looks like someone's pooped on the plate. Mm. Yeah, not exactly the type of review you'd put up on the fridge. And what was the star of this questionable show? Langoustine on top of cheese grits. What is that? That is the langoustine on top of cheese. God, put the poor langoustine out of its misery already. Anyway, it took a while to find it on the plate, but eventually Ramsay spotted it. But turns out Sasha might have bitten off a little more than she could chew. Literally. And where are the longest thing? On top of the cheese grits. And before you knew it, Ramsay dropped his verdict. The combination is just all wrong. It was time for Joe, and before he dug into the dish, he posed a pretty valid question. I give you $50 worth of langoustine and you give me this? Sasha had no idea how to react. However, she remained resilient and maybe a bit too optimistic that things would turn out okay. What she said next must have felt like a stab in the back. This is probably worth 55 cents. Mm. I guess she forgot that she was only a contestant on the show. Definitely not the most appropriate position for humor. And Joe wasn't amused. When is he ever? Thanks for nothing. Yep, and he didn't even bother tasting it. In the blink of an eye, it went right into the trash. This dish spelled the end of Sasha's MasterChef journey. But like Magic Dreamer mentioned, it honestly could have gone either way between her and Howard. And yeah, those big dreams she had turned into a hell of a nightmare. Like, what did that poor langoustine do to you? But here comes a dish from season two, which can only be described as a hot mess. And this time, the spotlight is on Angel, a contestant who, unfortunately, couldn't hack it with French cuisine. So it's starting to bubble, and five minutes left. I still gotta put my in. A huge dagger for an aspiring chef. As Angel nervously laid out her dish, she was far from confident. And well, she was right to be nervous. Heaping pile of mess. And then the burning question. Arone couldn't help but wonder why Angel was so disappointed. And Angel made her thoughts very clear. You look angry, what happened? French got the best of me. Arone dug deeper into the awkward moments, asking what exactly Angel had presented. And Angel was barely able to mumble out a reply. Where's the tongue? Uh, back there. It didn't do well. But there was a significant problem with her explanation. Where was the tart? Ramsay was curious to find out, but Angel had left it back at her table because it simply didn't live up to her expectations. With the main component missing, her own had nothing more to say than this. Obviously, the tart speaks for itself, so... I don't know what else to say. Arone swapped places with Ramsey, and although he was willing to give it a taste, Angel cut in by saying something she really shouldn't have. I already know it's a disaster. Yeah, no, you're not wrong. If you ask me, that was a hell of a bad move. It sounded like she was asking for trouble, and well, that's exactly what she got. Because what Ramsey said next was brutal. It's like the kind of dessert that gives you for a month. And then came the empathetic twist no one saw coming. Ramsey felt bad for Angel because he knew what she was capable of and he was certain that she had more in her. I'm more embarrassed for you because I think deep down inside you can do a lot better. But eventually, the final decision was made. By the end of the round, Angel's time in the MasterChef kitchen had run out. Your time is done inside the MasterChef kitchen. Please take your apron off and leave. But something that happened during season three's run was even worse. Episode 10 brought a challenge that was intended to separate the culinary wheat from the chaff. 
And well, it did what it was supposed to. Yeah, pizza. An easy dish to do well, but a hard dish to perfect. Enter Mike. Hopeful, but not exactly proud of what he managed to bring to the table. And what was his strategy, you ask? Well, he put all his faith into his pizza stone, hoping it'd save the day. As he showed off his creation, the judges weren't exactly reaching for the confetti. And Mike ended up blurting something out that would definitely land him in trouble. But I hope that I've done enough with the pizza stone that I can kind of just skimp by on this one. This is honestly starting to become a little bit of a theme, huh? Arone remarks that Mike had found a way to make the dish look dehydrated. Take a minute and just try to imagine a dry pizza. I bet you can't. Either way, it sounded like a slightly more polite way of asking Mike to pack his things and get out. It's like you found a way to make it like dehydrated. But Mike wasn't willing to give up. He tried to explain his lapse in his memory, but Ramsey wasn't having it. This is your worst performance. Mike's excuses were all but laughed out of the room. And that's when, in a moment that I'm still not able to wrap my head around all these years later, Mike admitted that he had completely blacked out during the cook. But the judges weren't having it. All you had to do was take one look at Joe. His face said it all. And then came the ominous prediction. Hope there's not a blank space at your cooking station tomorrow. Yep, at this point, it was certain. Mike had a good idea about what his fate would end up being. By the end of the tasting, Mike had kind of accepted it. Good job, Becky, you know, but what can I do, you know? Yeah, he hopes somebody, anybody, would screw up worse than him. But I mean, name literally anyone else who could cook up a dry pizza but him. I can't. In the end, the verdict was clear. Mike's pizza stone experiment didn't cut it. He was eliminated that night. Thank All you right. very much. No, it's a big Thank deal. You. All right, you did great. Thank you. Thank you. However, not many viewers were happy with this decision. While most felt Becky had the worst attitude, some felt that David shouldn't have gotten the boot. After all, his dish met its end in the trash, but let's not forget about Tally's raw flour. Did the judges make the wrong call? Was Mike robbed? Make sure to let me know in the comments below. Or feel free to pop into my Discord server and blow up my chat. Either works. All right, here's what I think. Mike might have not been the greatest cook that season, but he definitely deserved another chance. I can't help but feel like there was some untapped potential hidden away behind that dry pizza of his. Now, this reminds me of another peculiar elimination when things not only got heated, but messy. Literally. I'm talking about the time when Ramsey decided to give Tali a moment, even before he tasted the dish. He wanted Tali to witness the chaos he had sown in his way. Ramsey walked over, pointing out the disaster zone that used to be Tali's station. Utensils strewn across it, pots and pans in disarray, and more flower coating, well, everything, than we got snow this year. And believe me, it was a sight to behold. Look at the mess. Ramsey laid down the truth as plain as it could get. From there, all the way down and all over the place. Look at the cover. Well, that's one way to describe it. And a lot of viewers were on board with what Ramsey said. Not an unusual thing, but worth pointing out. I mean, a messy station is not only unpleasant to look at, but a veritable health hazard too. But of course, Tali was barely concerned. But let's just give him the benefit of the doubt for a second here. Maybe he was so engrossed in his dish that he simply forgot to pay attention to his station. I can buy that. So maybe, just maybe, his dish rose out of that chaos in an immaculate state, right? You wish. Because when Tali brought his dish forward, Ramsey wasn't even able to identify it with sight alone. Tali explained that it was flatbread with duck and three cheeses, served on a bed of raw flour. Yeah, you heard it right, raw flour. Dude's out here playing 4D extra-dimensional chess when I'm sitting on my couch trying to figure out how to play checkers as far as that raw flour move was concerned. Served on a bed of raw flour, right? That was not my intention. My intention was to roll out my, my flatbread and get it into the oven. Ramsey couldn't help but point it out either, and he had to physically remove a bunch of it from his knife after the first bite. Ew. But wait until you hear Tali's excuse. He claimed that it wasn't really his intention to leave the raw flour on. The plan was to roll out the flatbread and get it into the oven. But I mean, what he served speaks for itself. 
But just to make sure the point was properly driven home, Ramsey made sure to lay it out super clearly for our guy here. You work in a mess, you produce a mess. I'm struggling to identify what the hell you're doing. Oh, believe me, Tali probably should have been shown the door way earlier. Like, it was a miracle he made it as far as he did. And better cooks have been axed for far, far less. But honestly, what happened in this next mystery box challenge might easily be far worse. So the contestants were working with sweet stuff. Chocolate, bananas, strawberries, blueberries, brandy, ladyfingers, various spices and extracts, and ground coffee. The possibilities for what you can make with even half of this stuff are endless. Wow. Yes. Coming to the task at hand, the contestants were asked to whip up a dessert masterpiece in a mere 90 minutes. But as per usual, they can't all be winners. Q, Cutter, and Astrid who unwittingly soured what should have been a sweet night for them. Their creations were so awful that they ended up instantly eliminating one of them over it. First up, Cutter. I did a play on a cappuccino with a coffee pudding and a vanilla whipped cream. His ambitious cappuccino-inspired dessert was just plain confusing. As Cutter nervously unveiled his dish, a collective sigh of disappointment echoed through the kitchen. To add an unexpected twist, Cutter adorned his creation with a logo. A move that, rather than setting himself up for success, only made the situation worse. A proper kick in the You stuck a MasterChef logo. Cutter tried to salvage the mess by explaining it was his first time making something so complicated. Oh yeah, he'd place some high hopes on a hell of a risk. However, when the judges dissected Cutter's dish, they found the dish was as far from a cappuccino as you could possibly get. Honestly, to anyone, it doesn't look like a dessert. Joe made that sentiment crystal clear. Do you know what biscotti stands for? No idea, sir. Bis means twice. Cotti means cooked. Now, it was time for Astrid to present her dish. Lemon tart with lavender. Yeah, it was a simple dish, playing it safe, I guess. But as soon as Ramsey walked up to the table, he found a damning problem with it. Raw, right? I imagine so. You imagine so? Yep, the pastry was raw. And when Ramsey asked her what the ideal thing to do with a raw dish was, Astrid spoke her heart out. You don't serve it. Leave it in the oven. Well, I guess in this case, Astrid should have gone with her gut. Because what Ramsey said next was hard to digest. So yeah, in retrospect, it was obvious that Cutter's poorly executed dish was ever so slightly better than Astrid's raw tart. So it's no wonder Astrid left and Cutter stayed. Still, it ended up being a hell of a villain origin story for him. But this happens to remind me of another episode where something similar happened. We're here to distinguish who has a future in this kitchen and who doesn't. Yes, sir. Now, let's take a trip down the not-so-sweet memory lane of season two. The contestants were in an elimination round centered around dessert, with coffee as the key player. Starting to see the similarities here? Anyway, enter Max. Who thought he had cracked the code as far as his dish was concerned? Max scurried through the pantry, gathering ingredients for what he envisioned to be his greatest triumph yet. Brimming with pride, Max presented his creation. A towering structure of 15 crepes stacked together. The judges, however, just couldn't see his vision. Or, well, unfettered insanity more like. A little cream, some sugar. Ramsey was seriously puzzled. He couldn't figure out what he was looking at. But Max decided to break down the layers to try and make his vision clear. Cream cheese, mascarpone, espresso, cream, and sugar. However, his leaning tower of pity crumbled as soon as the judges had a taste. Metaphorically speaking. Genius. What in the hell is that? <laughs> it's about 15. Oh, man. I would have died of embarrassment if I were in his shoes. As for Arone, he couldn't even keep a straight face and burst into laughter. <laughs> and Joe, as always, pitched in his two cents for good measure. All in all, the judges were in agreement. Max's dessert lacks sweetness, somehow, even with all of those alleged layers. Coffee flavor or anything remotely pleasant. I don't get a lot of coffee flavor at all. I don't get 
much of anything aside from the weird texture. But this is where another controversy started to brew. Fans thought Max stayed on the show purely for ratings sake. The dude had one of the worst attitudes and couldn't even cook. But there was one thing he was good at, content. And in the world of reality TV, sometimes that's what matters the most. Do you agree? Let me know what you think. If not, at least K-Dubs is in my corner. Meanwhile, let's head over to another challenge from season seven, when one contestant tried and failed to make a pie. So what happened is, as the elimination challenge rolled in, contestants had to whip up the perfect pie in just 75 minutes. Should be obvious from what it said on the tin. And Brandy immediately got busy prepping Kentucky style. In my element right now, because back in Kentucky, I bake apple pie, sweet potato pie, pumpkin pie. Well, at first, she was all cool and confident, but it didn't last long. When Ramsey called Brandy up to showcase what she'd made, she was practically buzzing. Brandy, as excited as can be, revealed her masterpiece, a Granny Smith apple and cheddar cheese pie with maple bacon and pecans on top. Yeah, I don't get it either. It was a pie that was all about her Southern vibes and her kids' quirky breakfast habits. But uh, maybe she should have left that quirkiness at home, where it belonged. I don't know, maybe I'm just not Southern enough to understand this. Granny Smith apple and cheddar cheese pie with maple, bacon, and pecan. When Ramsey cut into the pie, you could practically see Brandy's dreams crumble in real time. Just take a look. Jeez, I just hope that those kids are in bed. Raw and soggy. Absolutely mouthwatering. Anyway, a disappointed Ramsey wondered why she even went for the Granny Smith apples in the first place. But of course, he had to drop a savage comment while he was at it. Because I mean, invoking horror movies wasn't exactly uncalled for in this situation. Because that scares the crap out of me. And again, that damp and half-cooked crust ruined what was already a pretty bad idea on paper. Because they're tart. So it's an apple that's unforgiving. It doesn't cook down that well. Now, when Graham had a turn, he pointed out that the apples and crust had practically congealed thanks to the undercooking. But coming back to Ramsey, he wasn't done. After the disaster unfolded, he decided to have a real talk with Brandy. He gave her props for the passion she was showing, but didn't sugarcoat exactly how badly she'd screwed up. Your passion, and I know you've got it, but I think this has been one of the biggest disasters you've cooked in this And again, Graham wasn't feeling the dish either, leaving Brandy to deal with the aftermath of her choice. The undercooking of the pie dough emphasizes the undercookedness of the apple. In MasterChef, stuff like Brandy's pie just doesn't cut it. You've got to prove that you've earned your spot. And that horrible excuse for a pie, well, it just didn't do it. I feel like I stepped into my comfort zone and completely screwed up. So, those were some of the most disgusting dishes to have ever had the displeasure of being served on the show. Which of the bunch do you think was the worst? Don't forget to let me know in the comments below. And if you thought this video was crazy, wait till you see what I got in store for you next.